Welcome to a new episode of Amplify Live, where leaders and readers connect with their favorite authors about their latest projects. I am Rob Simbeck. I'm an author in Nashville, Tennessee, where A.J. Levine lives as well. My website is robsimbeck.com. Today, it is my pleasure and honor to speak with Dr. Amy Jill Levine, who I'm proud to claim as a friend as well. She is Rabbi Stanley M. Kessler, Distinguished Professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies at Hartford Seminary and University Professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies Emerita, Mary Jane Worthen Professor of Jewish Studies Emerita, and Professor of New Testament Studies Emerita at Vanderbilt University. AJ is the author of many books, including her latest, The Difficult Words of Jesus, <laughs> A Beginner's Guide to His Most Perplexing Teachings. <laughs> we're discussing today. AJ, welcome. Hey, Rob. Nice to see you. You too. I can never get the tempo right with you. Never. I just, yeah, just move on. I mean, by the time we get done with all the titles, we're done. We're done with the webinar. So That's let's true. talk about the difficult words of Jesus. All right. It's so good to see you. I've been looking forward to this. Um, and now for, for those of us, for those of you who are with us live, we want to engage with you. So please post any questions you have for AJ in the comments, and we'll come to as many as we can later in our conversation. And now let's push the boat off the shore. All right. Jesus taught his disciples about following Torah. He gave them parables that let them wrestle with ethics and human nature. He offered beatitudes for comfort and encouragement. And then sometimes he said things that his followers then and now found and find difficult. And since that word difficult is in your title, let's start there. In what sense is some scripture difficult? Um, I think it's not just some scripture. I think much scripture is difficult, whether you're starting with the beginning of creation or you're just picking up with Matthew. Um, in, in the Bread of Life discourse in the Gospel of John chapter 6, after Jesus says, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, the disciples say to him at somewhere around verse 60, well, that's a difficult saying. Hello. Um, and what I try to do in this book is talk about the sayings that people would write to me about, because people keep sending me emails saying, I don't understand this and I don't understand that. So I pushed on those statements that have to do with contemporary questions of morality, because these are the questions that people were asking back then as well. Sell all you have and give to the poor. Uh, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get into heaven. And there's no camel gate where you just, you know, you take a package off. I mean, it's, it's meant to be an impossibility. Um, when he calls the Canaanite woman a dog, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs when he talks about, uh, in effect, uh, approving the position of being a slave. And how do we deal with that in our society when, when we recognize the horrible legacy of slavery and the ongoing problem of human trafficking? Um, there are so many of these questions where I think Jesus meant to arrest people's attention and get them to sit up and go, what? And get them to engage with him. He's, he's thirsty for conversations with individuals. He wants his disciples to respond to him. And I think anybody today who would consider themselves to be a, a follower of Jesus, or in, in my case, a, a person who spent my life studying Jesus, I think he would appreciate that engagement. And sometimes I think he would appreciate a little bit of pushback also. And and you say here that mature faith faces these things and wrestles with them, and you compare it to a relationship with a loved one. Absolutely. Um, so so Jay and I have been married for for more years than, than many of you listening have probably been alive. And you know, I'd love to say that the entire time was absolutely perfect. We fought for over twenty five years about whether to get a dog or not. We finally have it. I lost that battle for decades. Um, and there were other things that, that we have tussled with because that's what people in love do. But that's also the case with the scriptures of Israel. And Abraham argues with, with God. What, what if there are 50 righteous people in Sodom? Um, Moses argues with God after, after, Moses, after God gets the, the people out of slavery, through the Red Sea, onto the dry land. And then Israel starts complaining about the food. And God said, I've had it with these people. And, and you know, I'm going to destroy them. And Moses says, I'm paraphrasing. Don't do it. It won't look nice. You know, people will talk. Um, Job argues with God. Jesus argues with God in effect. Uh, let this cup pass from me. I, I don't want this. Why have you forsaken me? So arguing or trying even to get clarity, that's what builds a relationship. If somebody says to you, do this, and you have no questions whenever, that's not being in relationship. That's being a sheep. And I think we should have higher career aspirations than to be sheep. 
Yeah, and it, and so it's not just a matter of this was true in uh, the first uh, decades um, uh, it, it, in that time in the Roman Empire, and it doesn't apply anymore. This is, in many cases, he's taken us to a whole other level. Absolutely. Um, but that's what the prophets of Israel did. Uh, that's what the Pentateuch does. Uh, that's what the early church fathers did. Uh, that's why we remember this material in the first place. If he was simply going, well, oh, yeah, just live, live your life the way you want it. No. What he's doing is, is helping his followers live as if they've got one foot in the kingdom of heaven already. And some of those difficult sayings, which catch them up short, saying, oh, well, that means that the way I'm living now may not be the best way of living out what God expects of me as a child of God. Let's talk in general terms about approaching scripture here. And uh, with, with many Bible stories, and especially with some of the things Jesus says, we're expected to bring something to the table. There is, for instance, much to guess about or for us to imaginatively infer when it comes to the rich young ruler. Jesus is not spoon feeding his followers. Absolutely not. Um, and nor is he a cookie, to, to continue your culinary metaphor, it's not only spoon feeding, but he's also not a cookie cutter sort of guy. Um, so the instructions he gives to some people, uh, you know, come follow me, let the dead bury the dead, you come follow me. I mean, he's not saying that to Mary and Martha, they're keeping their home because he's got to have some place to, to stop for hospitality. So he looks at individuals and, and I think in a very helpful way, and this is also consistent with the God of Israel. Um, he says, here, here are your particular talents, to use a, a good biblical metaphor. Here are your particular talents, your particular gifts. Here's how I expect you to spend them. Here's how I expect you to demonstrate them. And on occasion, people might say, well, I'm not so sure about that. You want me to give my life away? I, really? And he'll have to explain, well, let me show you how to do it. So that his difficult sayings are also matched by some of his difficult actions because he never asks anybody to do something that he will not do himself. And that's one of the things that makes him such a brilliant teacher. And OK, so to stick with the rich young ruler to whom you devote the first chapter and that story, Jesus tells him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, then you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. We read uh, that when the young man heard that, he went away sad because he had many possessions. And you've just given me permission, I believe, not to have a huge yard sale, that I'm safe um, with what I have, as long as my relationship to it is right. Yeah, you may be. It depends upon what sort of call that you have and whether you've paid attention to it closely or not. Mm -hmm. Um, because different people will have different vocations. Um, and I suspect that this guy may have, regardless of, of how much you make on your multiple books and may you make millions, um, it, I, this guy's got a lot. And he's got a lot in an economy where there are very, very few people up on the top and most people are well down on the bottom. Um, but there's another nice note there. The story changes as we go from Mark, which is the earliest gospel, to Matthew and to Luke. So we call him the rich young ruler because he's young in one text, rich in another, and he's a ruler in a third. So we just merge them all together. Um, but in Mark's version, it, he leaves and Jesus looks after him and Jesus loves him. And, and I think that little model is, OK, you know what you're supposed to do. And Jesus has now planted a seed to take a good image from a parable. Jesus has now planted a seed, and I wonder if that seed's going to germinate. And he's going to sit back there and say, well, how am I going to be perfect in the sense of whole or perfect in the sense of shalom, in the sense of peace or personal integrity? And what do I need to do? But Jesus has also spoken to him earlier because, he, you know, he says to Jesus, well, I followed all the commandments, you know. And Jesus says, well, you know what the commandments are. But when he's listing what looks like the second part of the Decalogue, the second part of the Ten Commandments, he throws in don't defraud, which is technically not one of them. And I wonder if that sort of nailed this young man. So where did you get your money? Or if you inherited it, which is how most people get money in antiquity, um, in a zero-sum economy, if you inherited it, where did dad get the money? Did, did, he, did he have, um, was he holding debts and then when people couldn't pay foreclosed? And is that where your money comes from? So in that sense, uh, regardless of how you've got your lovely home and, and your estate and your car or whatever else you've got, what Jesus is asking us is in part, how did you get that? Uh, where did the money come from? Did you get money when somebody else should have had a share of it? Were you privileged in a certain way so that you had a leg up on other people? All of those questions are contained in this small dialogue, and they're contained in that little seed that Jesus has planted in our rich young ruler. 
And this kind of thing is echoed across history. I've been reading Augustine and he had a friend who this verse convinced him to do exactly that. He sold what he had and uh, became a follower. St. Francis, I believe, uh, was affected by this. So across the ages, I think what you're telling us is that different um, uh, pieces of what Jesus said and different pieces of scripture are designed to pierce individual hearts. Exactly so. And part of that depends upon uh, where else your, your, your original heart is located. Um, the Jewish tradition, the rabbinic tradition, basically disallows this because the rabbis presume, they presume they're talking to men who are married. And the last thing they want is for married men to sell all they have and give to the poor because that impoverishes the wife and the children. Jesus apparently is talking to single individuals saying, okay, you rich young ruler, I don't know if there's a wife there. I don't know if there are children there. I don't know if they're financially stable, but you, I think he's on his own. And he, because he's young, I get a sense of that. If you did uh, totally disenfranchise, you're not going to hurt anybody in your family. And then you can be more helpful to others. So part of this depends upon your own social position, your social location, whom else is under your care, and then how best do you distribute your resources? Which is the perfect segue, those kind of family relationships, to this, um, this phrase of Jesus. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. And we, now we know uh, what the commandments say about parents. We know about the command to love one another. So I want to talk to you about how we as mature readers can look at this. But let's start with your reaction to the book, Are You My Mother? Oh, yeah, because I wrote about that. So I, when I was a little child, um, my, my parents, my parents were in their 40s when I was born. I'm a happy, I'm a very, very happy accident. Um, and so they were very interested in literacy and in reading. So every night before I, I went to bed, I got to pick a book and then my mother and my father would read to me. Um, and people knew that I liked books. Um, so they kept giving us books. So I had this book. Um, uh, I have subs I gave it away as soon as I had the opportunity to give it away because I didn't want to uh, traumatize my own children with it called Are You My Mother? Um, and it was about this mother bird. I remember she had a little kerchief um, and she went off to find food for her little baby bird. And the baby bird wakes up and the mother's not there. And he goes around to different creatures. I think one was a steam engine or a backhoe or something. I said, are you my mother? That book panicked me. The very idea that I would lose my mother and not know who she was because she's the one who took care. Of, how could you possibly write a book like that for little children? I thought it was appalling. And I got from there to you have to hate your mother and your father. And I, that's one of those, Jesus, absolutely not. I'm not going there. But now I'm so arrested by his statements. What does he mean by that? Because, you know, I don't think he hated his mother and she stayed the course. I mean, she's at the cross in the Gospel of John. According to Luke, she's with the followers in Jerusalem after Jesus was crucified. Um, and I think she kind of knew, okay, he's Jesus. He might be a little bit rude on occasion like at Cana, but, you know, she's still there. Um, but it, what happens when you join the Jesus movement? Um, when you, you say, I'm going to be part of a new family. And what's going to define me is not going to be my parents and their household and their neighborhood and their friends. But I'm going to be part of a new family when Jesus says, who are my mother and brothers and sisters? When Mary and the brothers and sisters are outside, those those sitting around him, those who hear the word of God and do it. And that can give the impression to the parents that they're actually, what, what do you mean you're leaving me? And that's so hard. But that's the impression the parents might take away. And that's how strong the break is. And Jesus recognizes how unnatural that is, but still yet it's part of a call. And we see that manifested today uh, when, when children say to their parents, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go join the Peace Corps or I'm going to join the army. And I realize in doing what I think is the right thing to do that I might get killed. But this is what I feel my calling to be. Or those, uh, the various nuns, the women religious who have gone into battle zones in El Salvador or in the Philippines, and they never come back. And the parents are thinking, I have to let them go because this is their calling. It's not hate. It's the ultimate expression of love. 
And yet we've seen it through the ages. I, I remember many times seeing interviews with parents who children who have joined cults, which is a religion you're not a part of. Um, and the heartbreak that can go with us. And I would think that it would take a great maturity uh, as a believer, as someone who brings heart and mind to a relationship with Jesus or anybody really, um, to discern when it's appropriate to do this and how it's appropriate to do this. Absolutely. And it's a, it's often a very, very difficult question, especially if your, your leader doesn't have a real strong track record. So one of the things the Gospels do is they help us with determining what this track record is uh, by telling us right from the beginning that Jesus is not out there uh, on his own, uh, but he's doing this with divine help. Uh, Matthew, in ex an extremely helpful way, tells us what Jesus stands for right at the beginning of the gospel in the Sermon on the Mount. He's not throwing away Torah. Don't think I've come to abolish the law. He's actually making it more rigorous. So the law says don't commit murder. Jesus says don't be angry. That's harder. So if you know what he's teaching and you know that when he teaches, sometimes he uses hyperbole, he uses exaggeration then we can see that exaggeration as well. And when he talks about, you know, the commandments is love father and mother, that's still there. Hmm. And because you love your father and mother so much, you need a really, really strong term to say, here's how you affiliate with this new family of faith. And the nice thing here is they're not mutually exclusive. You can still love your mom and dad, and you can still be a member of this family. Um, after Peter gets called by Jesus, he makes sure that Jesus comes back to the house to heal his mother-in-law, which I very much appreciate. And that, that full quote ends, it goes on and talks about building a tower and going into battle and pre preparation for both. And it ends with, so therefore none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions, which doubles us back to the rich young ruler. Right. But it also raises the question of what we mean by disciples. Um, so we can use the disciple, the term disciple, the Greek is mathetes, um, in a very narrow way, like the 12 disciples who eventually become the 12 apostles in the Gospel of Luke. Um, there is no woman in the Gospels who's ever called a disciple. The, the only woman who's identified as a disciple in the New Testament is Tabitha. And she shows up in the book of Acts, somewhere around Acts chapter 9. And her major thing is to allow Peter to resurrect her. Um, but can you be a follower who's not necessarily a disciple? Um, I think you can. And I think what the texts are also doing is raising questions about are disciples a separate category for one gospel? Yes, perhaps for another gospel. No. Can you be a follower, but not part of that inner circle? Because again, people are called to do different things. Can you be a follower, but it, not a disciple, but a deacon? Can you be a follower, not a disciple, um, uh, but a bishop? How do we even define these terms? Um, I'm tickled when we have certain denominations like disciples of Christ. I'm thinking, okay, that works. And I understand that, but aren't the rest of them too? Um, and, well, no, we're Presbyterians or no, we're Methodists. What term do we want to use for ourselves? Uh, the gospels, particularly Mark and Matthew, like to, to use the term follower, not necessarily disciple, but follower or student um, or faithful listener mm -hmm. or antagonist. How do we see ourselves in relationship to Jesus? Children of, brothers and sisters of. Yeah. Is there an analogy, one more thing before we move on to the next chapter. Is there an analogy here to baptism in which one washes away an old life? And in some sense, there is the word hate for perhaps who I was uh, while I still have affection for you know, what I did and th there were good relationships there and things like that. Is uh, is there any analogy there to that <laughs> whole hate concept? Yeah, well, Paul refers to his life before his encounter with Jesus as scubala. Um, and and th the Greek has a translation that I probably best not use on air because it's one of those profane terms, um, you know, that which goes into the sewer. Uh, but he had to have felt that was really important because if you discount, if you discount something that's worth nothing to begin with, then then it really doesn't count. Right. Um, it, you can look at baptism. I think the better image is, is the born anew or born from above imagery that we get from the Gospel of John, chapter three. Jesus conversation with Nicodemus, unless unless you are born from above or born anew. Nicodemus says born again. It's the wrong translation. Um, 
by water and spirit, you'll have no part of me. And that's that entering into a new family, which in fact detaches you from your mother, right? Because you're now being born not from a womb, because you're not crawling back into her womb. You're being born in effect from this, this baptismal womb. At the same time, at the end of the Gospel of John, Jesus provides for the mom. So when he sees the beloved disciple, woman, he calls everybody woman, right? Woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. So he hasn't given up on her either. Take it as a both and. As somebody who enters a convent or enters a monastery or joins a sorority might be when you suddenly have new brothers and sisters who are not your biological relations. And that's where your loyalty is based. And other people who are not related to you by kinship or by uh, descent, by blood, they know they can count on you. These are your new family. And that's a blessed thing. Well, you referred uh, in your opening remarks um, to, to this about slavery. We turn to the saying, whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. Slavery or descent from slavery was pretty ubiquitous in the Roman Empire. You estimate maybe half of everybody. Um, yep. The Hebrew people had been enslaved. And then there was the long history of slavery in the West. How, in the light of all this, do we read this passage with modern ears? How do we wrestle with this? <laughs> Very carefully. Yeah. And, and the, the astounding thing is that so many Bible scholars until about 10 or 15 years ago weren't wrestling with this stuff at all. You know, we talk about slavery in the empire and talk about how many people were enslaved. But we never, for some reason, um, our, probably our own privilege or our lack of consciousness, um, at least for, for privileged people in the West, it never thought about like, well, what about people who are enslaved still to today where slavery is still legal in a few countries? Um, or uh, people who are descendants of slaves who were still dealing with the legacy of slavery um, and contemporary American racism because of it. Um, for Jesus to say to somebody who is free and wealthy, Give up your privilege as if you were a slave. That might be very good advice. But to tell a slave, just be a better slave, it can be personally liberating. I don't want to take that away. And I've read some, some records of people who actually say, now I'm comfortable in my position. I find it horrific. Uh, because it suggests that slavery is normative. Oh, what happy slaves they were. And now that they're under Christ, they're even happier slaves. How do we deal with that language today? But I'm so glad it's there. And I'm, I'm glad it's there for a couple of reasons. First of all, because it insists that we pay attention to the legacy of slavery. It insists that if we all can think of ourselves as slaves, then we all can think of ourselves as how we don't want to be slaves and what that legacy might be. We can also look back to the scriptures of Israel, which always inform Jesus because he's a Jew and that's his Bible. Those are his texts. Um, where when you go from some of the earlier material in Leviticus to some of the later material in Deuteronomy, what you find is that ancient Israel kept moving and moving away from, in, uh, away from approving of slavery, so that by the time you get to the end of Deuteronomy, it's pretty much impossible for an Israelite to enslave another Israelite. You have to pay off debts, therefore you have to buy people out of slavery. Ideally, what the text would have said, because it grounds so much of its morality in slavery, right? Uh, you must love the stranger who dwells among you because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You were slaves there, right? What it should have said is you shall let the slaves go because you were slaves in the land of Egypt. You learn from what you were in and you say, I don't like this. And because I don't like it, why should that, why should I enforce that on anyone else? The great teaching from Rabbi Hillel what is hateful to you, don't do to anybody else. Well, if it's hateful to you to be enslaved, why would you enslave somebody else? So what I think these statements about slavery do is force us to look for other biblical resources to figure out how we can go from approving of the tradition of slavery and at the same time recognize that for some people who are in positions of power, it's that very commandment to give up your privilege, indeed, to, to give your freedom to God, to say, this. it's that verse that makes me humble. It's that verse that tells me that I'm not in charge. You can read this text positively, and you can say, this text cannot be used at all. That's something individual Christians and individual communities are going to have to negotiate out. Is this a usable text, or has it become so blighted so toxic, so traumatizing that we can no longer use it. 
And you you bring up that um, we are looking at these texts in relationship to ourselves and our relationship um, with the text, with Jesus. And then there is the way that we are called to look on how it applies to our relationship with others. And when you speak about um, Jesus' call that followers take up their cross, you talk about the fact that um, worthwhile endeavors have pains and demands as well as rewards, and that one of the marks of discipleship is opening one's eyes to the suffering of others. It's not simply, how do I relate to this, but how do my fellows out there, the men and women around me, um, how are they affected by, by this as text and my actions in relation to those? Absolutely. That's perfect, Rob. That's Matthew 25. Um, and this is Jesus being in those positions as well. You know, Lord, the 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 sheep is a, if, when you get to heaven. If there's a sheep line and a goat line, get into the sheep line. Um, so the sheep, you know, the the sheep who were in the good line say to Jesus, you know, when did we see you in prison? And when did we see you hungry? And and when did we see you as a stranger so that we welcomed you? And Jesus says, as you have done to the least of these. But you have to notice the least of these in the first place in order to show that generosity and you need to be able to see the face of God in the face of everybody else and not just in the people who look like you or, or you know, or part of your family. That's it's part of Torah and it's part of Jesus teaching. Um, ancient Israel, they were enslaved. They knew what it was like. Don't do it to other people. You should recognize that. Um, on the other hand, and this is why this stuff is so diff what, difficult. Um, a number of people have said to me when I started talking with them about slavery, in fact, uh, uh, so viewers would know, Rob and I are part of a group where, okay, what, what happens in the group stays in the group. But I, I press my, my friends about, you know, what do you think about the slave language? Um, and on occasion, I get comments like, well, if I think of myself as a slave of God, then I know I'm ultimately free because no human is my master. Nothing is my master. Money is not my master. Fame is not my master. Beauty is not my master. God is my master, and therefore I am ultimately free. And I see how that works. On the other hand, I don't want to think about God as a slave master. That doesn't work for me. So what metaphors do we use? And might there be certain metaphors that we ought to retire and find better metaphors for today? I'm not thrilled with honored Christian soldiers either for, you know, metaphors. <laughs> Uh, now, okay, so speaking of treating the least of these, one of them that troubles uh, me as much as any other, when Jesus says, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans. He talks again about the lost sheep um, to the Canaanite woman, uh, yeah. to whom he says, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. He sounds pretty rough there. And now given the Great Commission and where this is headed, how do we deal with that saying? Yeah, great question. So that's what I wrote my dissertation on, you know, back when Noah was still on the ark. Be um, sure to know the title you wanted. Yeah, the title I wanted was Matthew in the missionary position. Uh, but but the, the good professors at Duke didn't think that was an appropriate title for a you know, a nice Jewish girl writing a dissertation on the gospel of Matthew. Um, so we called it the social and ethnic dimensions of Matthean salvation history, which was not much of a grabber. Um, I, so what Jesus is saying is, in effect, for the gospel of Matthew, and this is the way it worked historically, it's a two-part mission. The Jews have the tradition. Um, they have uh, an idea of a Messiah. They've got the promises of God. Um and Jesus comes from a Jewish environment. And if we begin with the idea that all politics is local, which I think it is, that's where you start, um, then the mission goes first to the Jews. And that's exactly what Paul says when he says to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's where it starts. So you start with your own people first before you go out and try to fix the world. And following in the Gospel of Matthew, which is only where these, this particular statement appears, this go nowhere among the Gentiles. Um, the Great Commission is Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. It's the last four verses of the gospel where Jesus says, now that all authority has been given to me <clears throat> and that now is important. So in other words, his status has changed because he has been faithful and gone to the cross and he has now been resurrected. He now has all authority. <clears throat> Excuse me. I get excited. And my voice goes out. Um, therefore, he says to the 11 uh, followers who are still left, Judas has hanged himself. Uh, go make disciples of all the Gentiles. You can translate that as all the nations. The Greek is panta hai ethne, ethne like ethnos or ethnic. Um, that's the second part. So in effect, he's saying you start with the Jews and then following the resurrection, 
Then you go to the Gentiles because the resurrection marks the beginning of the Messianic age and one of the signs of the Messianic age, and, and most Jews would have agreed with this, is that the Gentile nations will leave their idols um, or leave what today we would call paganism, um, and they would turn toward the God of Israel. They don't convert to Judaism because then the only people who would be worshiping God would be Jews. Um, they remain Gentiles, but they're Gentiles who no longer worship pagan gods. And Jews and Gentiles as equals worship God together. That's the model. So the problem in Matthew 15, which is the Canaanite woman, is Matthew has inherited a story from Mark chapter 7. It's the same story, but the characters change a little bit. So in Mark chapter 7, the woman is called a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, which is a very hoity toity. It's like, you know, a biddle who came over on the Mayflower. Um, and people up in si Tyre and Sidon, think Lebanon, um, are siphoning off some of the resources from Upper Galilee. So like these are the rich people and these are the colonizers who are coming in. And she says to Jesus, I've got a demon possessed daughter. Can you do something for me? And he says in Mark, let the children first be fed. In other words, I'll get to you, but you're not at my table right now to continue that culinary metaphor, but I'll get to you eventually, right? Um, and then she comes back with a clever word. Matthew ratchets it up. You're absolutely right. Matthew doesn't say, let the children first be fed. It's just, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she's been asking him. She said, Lord, help me. She kneels in front of him. She's begging him. Uh, the disciples intervene at one point. Matthew extends this story. And what happens here, and this is something that most people today don't recognize because we don't read first century Greek and Roman literature, is it's actually a literary convention. Um, multiple stories in pagan literature, in Jewish literature, um, of a person who's so far below on any social scale, who needs something from somebody who's got resources. And the person who has resources just shuts you down. But what do you do? Instead of crawling away and saying, okay, I'm a dog. And, you know, you leave with your tail between your legs and you wander off. And he calls her a bitch because to call a person a dog is, is, is calling her a bitch. And even though it really is puppies, it's little dogs are not much better than, you know, little bitches. Um, instead of ratcheting that up, well, you want to call me a bitch? Well, let me tell you, sir. She hangs in there. She says, you want to insult me? I'll absorb the insult. But even, even puppies under the table get the crumbs. And that's exactly what Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. If somebody, if somebody slaps you on the cheek, which is a slap of humiliation, don't hit back and don't cower, but absorb the blow and turn the other cheek and say, I'm still a human being and you still need to treat me like one. So what this story does in a marvelous way is say to people who are in positions of power like Jesus, you might not want to deal with this right now. But you must because she is a child of God and it doesn't matter where she comes from. And it's a good lesson for the disciples. And saying to people who need something, stay in the game. Don't punch back. Keep your dignity. Keep your calm. Stay in the game. Because that's what the Sermon on the Mount teaches. Mm. How fabulous is that? It is. It is. Um, you cite a fascination with hell that was especially fed by Dante in speaking of Judas, who you brought up a few minutes ago. He's yeah. way down there. Um, it does we, not go well for Judas. That's true. No. Can, can we talk about hell and outer darkness and the concept of damnation, which plenty of Christians have had a field day with for thousands of years and which Jesus used. And I remember, uh, I think it was Bertrand Russell talking about the great relish, uh, it might have been Bernard Shaw, with which he condemned scribes, Pharisees, and others um, to those regions. How do we wrestle with that? Yeah, like the place of outer darkness where there's wailing and gnashing of teeth, um, which sounds sort of like a dentist office without power and no Novocaine. I mean, it's just it's a horrible thought when you think about it. Um, I, 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 I never believed in hell because my idea of God was not somebody who would just condemn you to some sort of eternal torture. But I thought it was really interesting. And I thought Dante was just brilliant. What do you do if you don't like people? You tell a story about hell and you put all your enemies in there and then you can detail in verse form how bad things are for them. So, I, you know, I had a certain sense of it was not a bad idea, uh, but I don't believe in hell. And Judaism does not have a strong view of hell either. We sort of have a little purgatory thing. But we tend not to focus on heaven and hell. The more in antiquity the church talked about heaven and hell, salvation and damnation, the more the synagogue talked about sanctification in this world and said, let's God worry, let God worry about the rest. 
Uh, my friend Bart Ehrman, whom some of you may know, has made a very good case that all this stuff about the um, the unquenchable fire, the Greek is asbestos language, that's where the word comes from. Um, that doesn't mean that you burn forever. It just means you get burned up, right? It's like if you, it's it's like going to the garbage dump. Um, the fire's still going, but you know the original stuff is just ash. It doesn't exist anymore. And I think for early Judaism, that's a pretty good point. The good people in Daniel get resurrected, and the bad people, it's just oblivion. It's just the end of it. Um, so when I think about heaven and hell, I understand why people want there to be a hell, uh, because they want to put bad people there. But if that's what we're thinking, that puts us on the same scale as those bad people or people who have done bad things. That's probably the better definition for it. Um, rather than saying, well, if we're all in the image and likeness of God, um, then why would we take someone who is in the image and likeness of God and condemn that person to eternal torture? That makes no sense whatsoever. Um, so I think the greater focus should be on redemption rather than fear of hell. And more than that, I met so many people, including a number of my students, um, who, who were taught that if they didn't believe in a particular way, they were going to go to hell. Or if they doubted, they were going to go to hell. Um, and if you begin with that type of premise, it turns God not into a loving father. It turns God into a sadist or a bully. And it's belief through fear rather than belief because of love. And that's a really problematic type of belief. So I understand why language of hell was there. And it was current at the time. But did Jesus mean eternal torture forever and ever? Or was he just thinking oblivion? And I have a feeling he was just thinking oblivion. You're gone. And I'll add one more to that. And then we'll, we'll go to a couple of questions. Um, in relation to what we've just been talking about, when he says, if your eye or your hand offend you, um, pluck it out or cut it off so mm -hmm. that you avoid hell. And just to make sure I knew where the deep water people were on it, I emailed a friend this morning and said, does anyone take that literally or can we presume it's hyperbole? And he, I, I breathed uh, better because he said it was hyperbole. Good. So, how do we um, how do we look at what he says there and you extend it from if if he's got if he's using metaphor here, maybe the end of the sentence is too. Absolutely. And that's always a question that we have to ask. Um, and, and nor do we know how Jesus said things. I mean, did, did he say it with a smile on his lips and a twinkle in his eye or did he say, hey, pay attention to me? This this is this is rock bottom truth here. Um, so. That's why we need community, and that's why we need biblical interpreters, and that's why we need good Bible readers. Um, one of the things that I find really helpful when we get stuck with, with material like this is to figure out what a biblical touchstone might be. Um, it, it, when the scribe says to him in Mark 12, he's been teaching in the temple, and the scribe's really impressed with his answers. He gives great answers. Um, uh, and he says, what's the greatest commandment? Right? Because there are 613, so you kind of want to know. Um, and, and Jesus, who never quite answers a question directly, says, well, actually, there are two, right? Um, there's love of God and there's love of neighbor. So you take whatever other commandment you've got and you put them up against love of God and love of neighbor. Or as he summarizes the law and the prophets in the Sermon on the Mount, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, if any commandment seems to go against these basic thrusts, then one commandment has to be more important than the other. Um, if we are in the image and likeness of God, why would we destroy that image and likeness by deliberately maiming ourselves? That makes no sense. And in some cases, we can simply use logic. If your foot causes you to stumble, lop it off. I will guarantee you that if your foot causes you to stumble and you lop it off, you're going to be stumbling more. On the other hand, I have a very good friend um, who is a surgeon who has sometimes used language like that with diabetic patients who need to have a toe or a foot amputated to say it is better for you to have this foot amputated and go to heaven that way than to die with this foot, this gangrenous foot continually to affect you. Now, I'm not sure that Jesus was thinking about patients with gangrene at the time, but I think that's a very nice way of repositioning the text because here's part of the problem with the Bible or part of the gift of the Bible. It can't only mean what Matthew thought it meant or what, what we think Jesus might have thought, because we can't get into his head. 
So we always have to interpret the text in light of our, our own good sense or our church tradition or what we know about history or, or thoughts that our neighbors have had. That text is always open to multiple interpretation. And one of those moments of interpretation is, as your deep water friend puts it, I love that expression, um, full body baptism. Um, is this hyperbole or is this what we're supposed to do? Is this said to one person or is this said to everybody else? Is this time specific or location specific or is this for all people at all times? And we always have to ask that of the text. Okay, we've got some questions coming in. I, I really appreciate um, those of you who are viewing, taking part like this. Uh, let's start with, um, here's the question. Could you talk about Luke 16, 1 to 12? How do we understand Jesus commending the dishonest manager? Oh, I'm, my next book is going to have a chapter on that. I love this story. Um, it, the whole thing is problematic right from the get-go. Um, this um, uh, rich guy, um, and anytime you have a parable that begins with there's a rich guy, you know something's going to go wrong with the rich guy. That's that's Luke, right? Um, uh, so word comes to the manager. This is gossip, right? Um, your, your steward's, your steward's been cooking the books in effect. So the, the rich guy calls the steward, the manager, he's an oikonomos, calls the manager and says, what is this that I hear about you? You know, give me a count of the books. Um, he doesn't ask to see the books, which is really bad management on his part. Right. Uh, so the manager starts thinking and he's thinking in interior monologue. And in the Bible, when somebody thinks in interior monologue, today we have like thought bubbles. It's usually a sign of conniving, right? So if you can't say it out loud, there's a bit of a problem here. So he thinks to himself, you know, um, I, I'm too weak to dig. Well, no, you're not. If you have to get a, you know, a, a tough job because you got to pay the, you go do it, right? And I'm too proud to beg. Well, excuse me, right? I'm too proud, really? Oh, I know what I'll do. Uh, so that uh, when I am thrown out of my job, other people re will receive me into the houses. And then he goes to his master's debtors because this guy's got, he's got all these debts. He's, he's major, major wealthy. Um, and he says to the first one, how much do you owe? Which is a really problematic, of course, he's got the books, right? It's like the bank coming up and saying, how much do you have left on your mortgage? Do you tell the truth or not? Now, of course you would, but some people might shave a little bit off. Um, so the guy gives an answer and the, and the manager cuts back 50%. You know, you say 100, so write down 50. Who's cheating whom? I don't know. And at the end, after he's cut all these debts, the man, the rich guy finds out about it. And instead of saying, what? He says, in effect, well done, you know, good and faithful servant. Um, I'm not sure anybody behaved well and everybody wins. And that creates major moral problems. Is it okay to cheat somebody who's really wealthy? I mean, you wouldn't cheat the, the person who owns the corner store who's barely making ends meet. But what if it's a Fortune 500 company and they made a mistake on, on your paycheck and you're, you're the, um, you work in the mailroom? At what point is the cutoff? Um, if somebody gives you an option, uh, an uber wealthy person makes a mistake on a bill, do, do you say anything? But what happens is the poor rich guy, he's stuck because now everybody's thinking how extraordinarily generous he was. And it was possible in antiquity, we actually have records of this, where in, in cases where people could not pay their entire debt, um, the people who held the debt would say, well, just pay a part of it and I'll collect later in better times. Gives you a sense about rent control today and what we might want to do in order to keep a good tenant. They were thinking that back then as well. Everybody benefits. The steward keeps his job. The rich man has a fabulous reputation because everybody's thinking he's generous. Everybody's debts are cut. I think everybody did something that ordinarily we would consider to be, if not fiduciarily irresponsible, morally abhorrent. And Jesus says, what do you think about this? And then at the end of the parable, I think Luke is actually flailing because um, I don't think Luke knows quite what to do with it because Luke likes stories wrapped up in neat little bows. And one of the one of the points about Jesus I love so much is he gives us stories or, or words that are difficult. He gives us stories with which we should wrestle. He makes statements. And then I think he expects Mary Magdalene to look at Peter and, and they'll have a conversation about it. That's what good followers do. There's more to say about that, but that's a good start. <laughs> um, how may we respond to members who question the necessity of an active role of the church in dismantling racism and sexism and instead insist our focus should be only on personal salvation? 
Well, um, you know, I'd start with Matthew 25. We've already been there. Uh, personal salvation means taking care of the least and the lost and the last. Uh, personal sub, because otherwise you're going to be in the goat line and that's not a good line to be in. Um, if it's all about personal salvation, then you have no community. Um, when Jesus teaches his followers to pray in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, when you pray, pray like this, our father, not my father. If it were all about personal salvation, it would be just my father. You know, uh, It's our father. We're all in this together. Give us, forgive us as we forgive others. That entire prayer insists on relationality. You're part of a community. So in order to follow Jesus, it can't just be about personal salvation because personal salvation has to be based in a broader community model. That's a very Jewish way of thinking. And Jesus, good Jew that he is, thinks in exactly the same way. If you have no community and you're not working to build up that, that community of God, then you're not doing your share of the process. That's not loving your neighbor as yourself. If you're allowing your neighbor, and everybody's a neighbor, by the way, in Christianity, everybody's a neighbor. Um, and if you don't think everybody's a neighbor, well, then hell, heck. Um, Leviticus goes on to say you have to love the stranger who dwells among you because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. If you love both neighbor and stranger, then it is your duty to do your best to dismantle those things that prevent both neighbor and stranger from living life to the fullest or living, as John would put it, life abundant. And to follow on something you said there, how does, there's another question. How does understanding Judaism mean understanding Jesus? Because if we yank him out of his context, uh, first of all, it's theologically retrograde. Uh, if we take, from a theological perspective, you think about Jesus, he's supposed to be both fully human and fully divine. And you can't be fully human unless you exist in community with a history, with a family, with a geography, with a language, with a human body. Um, so it's, it's actually denying Jesus' own humanity. Um, if you unhitch Jesus from what the church would, would, call, the, would call the Old Testament, um, you, you basically cut him off at the roots because that's what he's drawing from. As he says in the Sermon on the Mount, don't think I've come to abolish the Torah. I've come to fulfill it. And by fulfill it, he doesn't mean put a little check mark next to it. You know, I've taken care of it so you don't have to bother. It means I'm going to show you how to fulfill it to its core meaning, its deeper meaning. Uh, watch me then do it. Um, so unless you understand first century Judaism, you're going to get him wrong. And most people who misunderstand first century Judaism usually wind up setting this very toxic Jewish system. And then Jesus comes like the rider on the white horse. That's an image from Revelation, you know, and, and says, oh, I'm the only person who cares about women's rights and health care and, you know, clean water. Um, and that's just bad history. It's also bad theology. And it's less interesting. Mm. Um, here, here's one for somebody who obviously knows you. Could you share the story of your mother's death and how that informs your own understanding of heaven and hell? Uh, yeah, this, this is a true story. Um, so my mom was 44 when I was born. Um, uh, my mother, God bless her, smoked three packs of cigarettes a day uh, and, and lived to 80. Um, so I'm teaching with uh, in, at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, living in Philadelphia with my husband and my two kids. Uh, and I get a call from my cousin saying, uh, I think your mom's had a stroke. She's in the hospital. You have to come home. So Jay and I uh, call his parents to take care of our children. We fly up to Philadelphia. We fly up to New Bedford, Massachusetts, to St. Luke's Hospital, where I was born. Um, we get to intake. Um, I used to be a candy striper, like a, volu a youth volunteer when I was a kid. So I get to intake and, and uh, I, the, the charge nurse says, you know, it's not visiting hours. I said, I'm Dr. Levine. This is Dr. Geller from Philadelphia. I didn't bother to say we were PhDs. Um, we've just flown in. Um, we flew into Providence. We rented a car. We've driven to New Bedford. I, I really like to see my mother. I used to work in this hospital. I didn't say I was a candy striper. So she looked at my ID, you know, she checked everything out and she said, you know, I, I, okay, I think it'll be okay. And she made sure that somebody accompanied us. Right? So my mom's in ICU. We eventually get her out of ICU. She's in a, 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 a room, semi-private room, and it's pretty clear she's going to die. And my mother insisted on a do not resuscitate order because she did not want to be kept alive for, for any artificial means. She had stage four cancer. She had emphysema. It was really hard for her to breathe. And she was not well physically, but the mind was there. So my mom's on a morphine drip um, and she was asleep most of the time. And Jay and I uh, were taking, there was one chair in the room. So, you know, one of us is sitting on the bed. The other one's sitting on the chair. So I'm sitting on the bed. Jay's sitting on the chair. It's a Saturday night. And my mother wakes up, looks at me and says, what's going to happen to me when I die? 
And I just looked at her. I said, Mom, oh, you'll see Daddy. And my mother says, I look like hell. So I said to her, it's hard for me. So I, I said to her, but mommy, um, when you see daddy, you'll look as beautiful as you looked on the day that you got married. You know, I've seen the pictures. And she looks at me and she says, how do you know that? And I said, mommy, I'm a professor of biblical studies. I know these things. I have a PhD in religion. <laughs> and she looked at me and I looked at her and she smiled and I smiled and she closed her eyes. And I just sat there and Jay's looking at me. And a little bit while later, she flatlines. And during that time, Jay and I didn't say anything to each other. So as, as we're waiting for the nurse to come in, because all these machines go beep, beep, buzz, buzz. Um, Jay says, you don't believe that. I've never heard you say anything like that. Yeah. Uh, but when I was talking to my mother, I believed everything that came out of my mouth. I wasn't lying. I wasn't making up a story. It was true. Now, that was 28 years ago. Um, and if you ask me that now, I mean, is I don't know. But boy, I believed it at the time. And I'd like to think that it's true. I don't know. Mm. Here's one that just came in. Does Jesus say anything that would relate to the world of LGBTQ? Um, I would like it if he would say more. Um, he doesn't directly, but one can read into some of those statements uh, because he does praise people of um, uh, non, non regular, I'm not sure what the word is, non expected um, sexual practices. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, um, he talks about those who were born eunuchs and those who were made eunuchs by others, or castrated by others. And those who make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. I am right now reading a brilliant, brilliant dissertation uh, by uh, Jennifer Alexander precisely on those verses. And she reads them as a parable. But eunuchs were people who did not procreate, could not physically procreate. Um, and they had various reputations, some of which filtered over into LGBTQI models. Um, so there's a possibility. He's also... Um, uh, unmarried in a culture where most people are married. Um, so celibacy was known in Judaism. He takes, but it wasn't like super popular. Um, so he goes that minority sexuality route. Um, there's a part when Jesus, in, in the Gospel of John, when he's on the cross, and only John says that the soldiers are surprised that he died so quickly because most most people are it takes two or three days to die of crucifixion, eventually die of asphyxiation because you can't get enough air up your lungs. Um, and a soldier pierces his side with side with a sword and blood and water come out. That's a birthing image. And if Jesus is giving birth to the church, that's gender bending. And sometimes when we look at medieval art, um, Christian artists would pair Mary showing her breast, the expression is Maria Lactans, the, the lactating Mary, and Jesus showing the hole in his side, which is very high up at the breast level, um, as if Jesus is also nursing through that blood, nursing his children, and that's also a type of gender bending. So does he say anything that would make it like the, the one proof text that if you're if you're not heteronormative, you can say to your parents, hey, Jesus approves of me. There's nothing that's that direct. But there's enough in there. And there are other some of these statements, other such statements, and there are other such statements in Paul and in the rest of the New Testament uh, that people who identify as part of the LGBTQI plus community can say, yeah. This speaks to me, too, in a particular way. Um, would Jesus approve? I'd like to think so. And for the very last question, I'm going to ask you to sort of sum up what people can expect if they haven't purchased the book yet, when they do, what you wanted to bring to the discussion. I want people who read the New Testament, whether they're reading for faith reasons or Bible study or historical study, whatever, I want them to wrestle with the text. 
I don't want people to say, well, Jesus says that that's the end of it. I believe it. I, 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 if the church considers itself to be part of Israel of God, grafted in, as, as Paul would put it in Romans 11, um, then it ought to be able to, to, to wrestle with some of these more difficult statements and say, well, if it's not meant literally, then what does it mean? And how do I apply it to my own life? Or how did Jesus apply it to his own life? Um, the difficult words, I think, are there as I mentioned earlier, in effect, to arrest us, to catch us up short and say, what? What do you mean by that? And then we start reading for ourselves and then we start reading in community and then we start thinking about how people have read this stuff in the past and we think about how it fits in with that love of God and love of neighbor or the golden or the silver rule. And if we wrestle with the text rather than just pass them over or say it's too hard because it's not too hard, it's just hard then I think we become better Bible readers. Um, and for me, when I wrestle with the words of Jesus, even though I'm not a Christian, I still wrestle with the words of Jesus. And I think that wrestling actually makes me a better human being because I find that they indict me. Uh, they force me to confront my own prejudices or my own laziness or my own reluctance to step out of my comfort zone. And Jesus says, hey, lady, if you really want to be a child of God, if you really want to be a decent human being, pay attention to this stuff. And when I pay attention to him, I find at the end of the day, I'm probably a better human being because at least I think I've done a better job of loving my neighbors myself and loving the stranger who dwells among us because we were strangers in the land of Egypt. Jesus teaches me that. AJ, thank you. It's a wonderful book. I recommend it highly to all of the those of you who don't have it yet. And once again, as you've uh, taught us, as you've helped us think and wrestle, you've been a delight. And oh, what so, fun to talk about this. This is great. Thank you, Rob. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, thank you for your questions. To discover more difficult words from Jesus, go to amplifymedia.com and search for the difficult words of Jesus. Amplify Media has made the first episode of AJ's study available to watch for free. And if you missed the other episodes of Amplify Live, go to amplifymedia.com and select the free resources link in the top corner to watch. Thank you to Amplify Media for sponsoring the series. Visit their website to learn more about the resources they provide churches. Have a wonderful week. Thank you all very much.